of the Supreme Court of India, but also he's from cyberlaws.net. And uh, I think you've probably got a, quite a few words to say on this. This is an area of cybersecurity that's uh, of particular interest to you. Sure. Well, I personally believe that there is... Uh, is this working? I think you might have to pull it clo very close to your mouth in order to make it work. So it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, I personally believe that these are issues that uh, the world really needs to have bigger perspectives. Now, large number of times we've been seeing that uh, people are tending to do lip service. Uh, these are big lingos to talk about, but when it comes to hardcore realities, somewhere down the line, there's a lack of a political will. The political will lacking is found much more in developing countries than in developed countries. But then that lack of a political will is also because of the uninformed nature of the debate. Now, invariably, people are looking forward to the thought leadership in the West on how to tackle these issues. Now, it's a historical reality that internet got uh, introduced, originated and developed in the US and the West, but it's also a reality that the, the sun has shifted its focus. The focus is now back on this part of the world where the developing countries like China, like India and others are going to basically hold fort, primarily because of their size, primarily because of the internet penetration, the depth, in those scenarios, the cultural values suddenly start playing a different uh, ball game altogether. And it's here I personally believe that uh, concept of cyber security as a, a concept, as a way of life, is perhaps missing. To that extent, we can also see that in developing countries, even data protection or concept of data as an asset is missing. Now, it's far more important to create capacity building by the relevant governments within their within not only their own organizations but also within the netizen community uh, and also to transcend the digital divide to pe make people far more informed about what is cyber security how can people contribute we have to appreciate much that we would not want to talk about it that there's a huge digital divide and even in countries uh, like india there's a huge digital divide how do you address them and how do you carry with you that huge chunk of people who are below the digital divide, for them, instances or issues like this have no relevance or bearing on their day-to-day -day economic uh, survival conditions. But at the same time, it's also important that the countries in this part of the world provide thought leadership. One way of giving thought leadership is to say, hold, hold on, this is a new legislation or this is the new approach that we are doing. Let's go about and propagate further. Now, to give an example about, say, cybercrime, now, internationally, you just mentioned about an intervention about Council of Europe. Council of Europe has got its own treaty, the Convention on Cybercrime. Large number of developing countries, though, are in sync with the fact that the principles enshrined therein are extremely relevant in the context of this part of the world, but still do not have the political will to join them for a variety of reasons. Similarly, when you talk of privacy, the concept is non-existent in some jurisdictions, and the, the, the cultural and the socio, uh, sociological factors are such that you can't expect a very kind of a uniform approach. Let me give an example. You are here in India. India has got a law on information, uh, information technology. It's known as the Information Technology Act 2000. But still, it's not very proficient or eloquent on the issue of privacy. Is the concept of privacy existing? Yes. But today, when we are seeing more terror attacks, when Terrorism is suddenly uh, gaining center stage attention. I believe that people here are willing to forego portions of their uh, privacy, just, just in a similar kind of a manner as what happened in the United States. After the 9-11, people were willing to forego their privacy for a larger good being na national security. And also, today, these systems are likely targets of attack. Uh, it's bigger economies which are going to be dominant IT superpowers, but are effective regulations, are effective mechanisms being yet involved? As a lawyer, as an attorney, I must say that I'm not satisfied, primarily, because I have to look with a microscope. I have to look with, uh, a, with a magnifying glass to find out, hold on, what is this com country going to say on this issue? Another big issue is um, how do you ensure that people have the adequate request, uh, uh, respect for privacy. Now, 
In a country like India, it's still judge-made law that defines what's privacy. The Supreme Court of India has defined that the right of privacy is a part of your fundamental right of life, which is guaranteed by the Indian Constitution under Article 21. But yes, there is no law on privacy in our country. So you don't have a law of privacy. How are you thinking or ex of expecting to implement uh, specific provisions pertaining to uh, protection and preservation of privacy of people in the context of internet, cyberspace, as also use of computers, computer systems, and networks. Another historical aspect that we need to consider is the fact that in these parts of the world, governments like to listen. If governments want to listen, electronic interception is the of the day. Laws and legislations across different economies have detailed various legal mechanisms of how to effectively intercept. But are laws being followed? That's another issue. And more importantly, uh, where is the balance being made in this part of the world, uh, say between developing countries, uh, one on the issue of privacy and the other one on the issue of security? I think there are huge challenges. Currently, I, what I'm, I'm actually missing as a, as a proponent of cyber law is the, the focus of political will to create more capacity building. That's one. Number two, I want countries in this part of the world, the developing countries who are going to hold center stage attention on the internet to be far more focused in, number one, clear, clarifying their vision and their strategy on how they want to do, deal with these issues. Unfortunately, if you look at developing countries across the world, it's, a, it's normally one legislation relating to internet or computer systems or network. That one legislation is a jack of all trades legislation. It'll have invariably, it's like a typical Bollywood film. It has got different elements of different drama, of comedy, of action, and put together in one legislation. I think it's time that the countries need to realize that these are serious, significant issues which require detailed, serious deliberations, specific provisions, and more importantly, I believe provisions which can actually effectively implement it. This has to be supplemented by constant capacity building. Unfortunately, capacity building is one area that's lagging behind to a large extent. We need to ensure that the capacity building has to be given the right focus. And finally, I think at the end of the day, there's a need for updating. In, in the Indian culture, you know, we, have, uh, we have a concept when you go back to the Ganges, uh, which is a very, uh, well, it's a national river of India. It's a very pious river. You back, go back to the Ganges after a lifetime, only to renew your energies, to dedicate yourself and your energies fresh. I think it's time that the countries in this part of the world need to renew their vision on how to deal with these, just because aspects of privacy are not present in your jurisdiction does not mean that the upcoming netizen population of your country is not expecting privacy. They are expecting privacy. They are ex also expecting that you as nations are going to only take care of their physical security, but also the security of their data and information in the electronic form, as also the secure use of their computers, computer systems, and networks. And if governments across the world fail in this scenario, Clearly, I think somewhere down the line, a normal netizen has a feeling of deception. He gets a feeling of rejection and saying, hold on, this is what not I was expecting from the governments. So that needs to be addressed. And finally, I think somewhere down the line, you can't really address cybersecurity, you can't address privacy without addressing the much bigger issue of cyber crimes. Now, today in the Internet 2.0 world, people are vomiting on the Internet. When I say vomiting, People do not have the maturity of what they are talking on the internet. So right from my girlfriend to my personal details, to my past life, to my hobbies, hold on. Tomorrow, what are you saying is going to be indexed, is going to be archived for times immemorial, and your children, your grandchildren mm. are going to reference them. Mm. So it's not a, a famous actress who's, uh, you know, who's getting shot topless, <laughs> who's concerned whether her children are going to see it or not. It's now a question of you as normal netizens who are going to be impacted. And if what happens, if somebody hijacks my identity online, I'm going to have a harrowing experience. Now, I've got so much of a presence in different parts. Somebody goes across and says, I'm so and so. Now, before I could know it, I am finished. Why? Because the damage that's caused is irreparable. But are the legal structures, are the legal regimes of the countries well-equipped to deal with cybercrime? Not at all. Why? 
because uh, cyber crime is considered as a hallowed uh, you know hallowed sector somewhere in the horizon well cyber crime can will touch you that kind of a vision needs to go out the ostrich attitude needs to give way to far more pragmatic thought process hold on cyber today is a part of the developing countries india at this point, one of the sections i was informed is at number 9 of the total number of top 10 countries from where spamming is being originated number 1 still being the united states well vernacular content has has really ensured that vernacular spam is now coming. Now in India, we have come up with the concept of voice SMSs. Rather than sending your SMS through your mobile phone, I can actually um, you know, leave a voicemail for you. Hold on. People leaving all kinds of voice messages for you on the internet for other people to download, listen to you. I'm actually seeing a, a, a scenario which is going to be a horror, of, a horror kind of a scenario for individual, for management of internet reputation but more importantly for trying to uh, protect your national computers computer system the networks there's a concept known as the protected systems concept which is that certain governments have reserved upon themselves the right to dedicate certain critical infrastructure as protected systems and if you are trying to mere have access to that protected system that access has been defined as a penal offense punishable with a, a high quantum of imprisonment say 10 years imprisonment in India and fine now, I think this is one mechanism which countries can effectively utilize to go ahead and dedicate not just your critical infrastructure, but also normal, regular computer systems which have a bearing upon not just the stability of your national internet exchange, but also upon the deliverance of electronic governance functions in a manner that it reaches the common man. So I think it has to be a variety of approaches. Merely lip service is not going to do. Today, the netizen is an extremely disappointed and yet a very angry lot. The recent Mumbai attacks have shown, hold on. The people of India are coming on the streets and saying, we want accountability and enough is enough. And mind, a majority of that propaganda, or shall I say, the anger, is actually being uh, vomited through the internet. It's time that the national governments try to find out how can they effectively deal with it. How can they effectively secure their computers, computer systems, their networks? How can they actually come up and constantly upgrade their criminal regimes and their legislations in such a manner so that uh, the latest and the new kinds of evolving cyber crimes are effectively covered and yet at the same time still have respect for individual rights, have respect for privacy just because, well, the country is under terror attack does not mean that you have a certificate blanket uh, a license to go ahead and intrude upon any computer record of any computer system. Mind you, let me give an example of India. In India today, Indians still like to save their personal details, their personal nuances on web emails and web email accounts, which are free web-based based email accounts. So I think uh, it has to be a cumulative kind of an approach. It has to be balanced, but far, far more important is the commitment, the reiteration of political will to ensure that an adequate balance is appropriately arrived at, not only between cybersecurity and privacy, but also at any other aspect which tends to impact negatively or injuriously the effect of uh, the, the interests of people who are using computers, computer systems, computer networks, as also data or information in the electronic form. Right. Baba, thank you.